What's going on everyone? Bales and welcome back to another AFL Fantasy Head to Head. In advance, apologies for the, uh, if it is buffering on my end, uh, stupid internet, uh, Telstra can't figure their crap out and uh, NBN can't either. So uh, hopefully we'll just push through and uh, keep going. But we're continuing on the theme of special guests. So you would have seen him on the Ball Boys Fantasy, potentially the basketball podcast, but if not the a- the Ball Boys Fantasy, AFL Fantasy podcast, sorry. Mitch, Mitch, how you going, man? I'm doing well, mate. Um, glad to uh, glad to be on here, and uh, yeah, we're talking about a two two ex teammates today, and uh, yeah, excited to get stuck into it. Yeah, no, nah, it's this one. I think is going to be. I think a lot of people are going to be choosing between the two. I don't know. Some people are going to have both, but I think a lot of people are probably going for for one, maybe, and then maybe looking for a bit more value with a few other players. We are talking about Stephen Canelio and Tim Taranto, so both big forward premiums. And I think we're going to want them in our teams at some point in the year. But can you start with one or both? So I'm going to be taking Stephen Canelio today. And uh, Mitch, who is the Richmond fan as well, is going to be taking Tim Taranto. So Mitch, why should coaches be looking at starting with Tim Taranto in their sides this year? So, well, let me just put it off off the bat here. Um, I'll I'll try to to remain as unbiased as possible. In fact, I've said this before on my podcast that... I actually find myself going the other way when it comes to Tigers players. If if they're on my own team, I, I feel like I criticize them more harshly than uh, uh, sort of view them more favorably just because a lot of the times I don't want to uh, be watching a game from a Richmond fan point of view and also if they're, if they're stinking it up from an AFL fantasy point of view, uh, weigh me down that way. So um, hopefully not too much bias here, but I think for Timmy T, it's... It's just the fact that we've seen this guy um, pop onto the scene um, a, a few seasons ago, 2020, uh, 2019, he, he popped off for 112 uh, and a half points per game. So he has a, uh, has a huge ceiling about him. He did that in just his third season in the AFL. He's still only 25 years old, um, so coming right into his prime at the moment. In 2021, we've seen him average 108 last year. He had a down year, 95.5. We do know that, obviously, the Giants were a bit of a mess last year with their CBA uh, midfield. There was a lot of talk last year. He was sort of a really expensive player at the start of the year. We were all sort of waiting for him to uh, – I think it was the um, the Toby Green injury at the start of the season. We expected him to sort of start a bit more forward and then press into the midfield once Toby Green came back. Uh, and when that did happen, it just sort of never really improved. He had – uh, an injury in there as well. And uh, for the season, ended up averaging uh, 44% on the year. And, um, you know, even the year before, however, you know, averaging 108 points that he did for the season, that was only on 49% uh, CBA. So the guy's got a huge ceiling. He's got a big um, scoring pedigree. He tackles, he gets marks, he gets a lot of uh, disposals. He's exactly what the Richmond midfield is looking for in terms of that in under uh, defensive tackling type player. And I think that there's no world that I see him going under 50% uh, CBAs this season. I, I see him as that 65 to 70% sort of guy. And if he if he can go for 108 points on 49% like he did uh, in 2021, even in a Richmond game style, which I know we're all sort of panicky about, I think when he boosts those CBAs up, he should be there or thereabouts sort of is what I'm projecting him to be. So being, again, it's not much, but slightly cheaper than a Cogs, I find myself gravitating towards a uh, Taranto whose role, uh, funnily enough, uh, being on a different team, I think his role is a bit more secure in my eyes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do agree with that point. And it's, yeah, it's just under 40K, the difference. And, just quickly going back to uh, rehash the past. Uh, I don't know if you uh, know, but I think a few people that listened to me know last year, me and Tarant had a bit of a um, bit of a love-hate relationship. I brought him in in round five, I believe, instead of going for Callum Mills, who was about 110K cheaper. I went for someone different, and he stunk it up. He didn't score 100 for me for the rest of the year. That, that would hurt. That would definitely hurt. Yeah, that it, that, it killed my uh, top 100 chance, that's for sure, um, or at least top 500 if I wanted to go for a higher rank. So um, that was my big mistake of the year. But uh, with Taranto, you did mention the Richmond game style. I think that Taranto is that guy that can fit into the game style because of how fast Richmond play. And even when he goes forward, because Richmond are so 
moving the ball quickly into the forward 50. I think even when he rests forward, he'll still get a lot of the ball. So are you, you're you not too concerned with the Richmond game style because of the player that Taranto is? Yeah, I think I think there's there's obviously valid concerns in terms of their um, game style and the lack of scorers that it's presented in the years past. However, I think it is a little bit overblown. Um, I, I'm a true believer that if a Dion Prestia had had healthy seasons, he's a guy that could have pushed triple digits quite comfortably. Yep. And and outside of him, like the rest of the players that have gone through the Richmond midfield, they're just not fantasy players. Like uh, even someone like you know Dusty Martin in the last few seasons, he's He's a kind of guy that he's getting a lot of CBAs, but he's playing more as a, as a forward. He starts uh, in the center, moves forward, never goes into the, the defensive 50. Um, his tackles have completely dried up the last few seasons since his yeah. Brownlow year. So um, it, there's not really been the, the sort of cattle to, to go in there and, and produce at a high level. Um, we saw a JD Short go in there and he was able to still get five marks per game in a midfield role. So... It's, it's not as though that the marks are just completely barren in there. Now, again, Jaden Short is not the tackler that a player like Taranto is. So I think when you have a player that can do both tackle and mark and get a lot of disposals at the same time, despite the what we consider to be a, a poor fantasy side, I think that when you inject a player like Taranto into that team, um, it, it's only going to – I think you can beat the odds and I think you can buck that trend and be the first midfielder to average more than 100 since Dusty in 2017. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I can't remember who mentioned it, but uh, I think it might have been on Trey's podcast. But they did say that Prestia take out his injured scores, he essentially averaged like ninety nine, like essentially one hundred. So, and I think Taranto is a, at least a five point better player. So, if that's the case, you're probably getting a like a one hundred and five. But what do you see Taranto averaging? I've got him pegged around that 105, 106 kind of range. I think, you know, his best was 112. He did a a 108 on uh, 49% CBAs now. I'm giving him a slight haircut on that because of the Richmond system. But again, 49% in 2021. I'm expecting more like 65 to 70% this season. So I think that 108, even a 110 is in the realms of possibility. But I'm sort of... More, I guess, realistically looking at that 105, 106 kind of a mark. Uh, and I think I think that's still successful. That's still 10 points of upside on his price. So I think that that's um I think that's pretty safe to expect. Yeah, and he's got and he's got the setting as well. So he can definitely give you those big scores. I don't think there are there aren't too many forwards that have got the same ceiling that he's got. So yeah. But another player that has got a ceiling, and we did see at the back end of last year is Stephen Canelio. So mentioned Tim Taranto is out of the Giants side and so is Jacob Hopper and Tanner Brun, but it just means more opportunity. So Stephen Canelio, I would imagine would be one of the guys that moves more permanently in there for the whole year. Of course, Tom Green and a few others are going to move in there as well. But Stephen Canelio, when he uh, Leon Cameron left, he averaged 68% of the CBAs from that point on. And he actually averaged 109 after um, he left. So that is a big sum size. And we know Cogs... Is is a beast when he's when he's in the midfield. I think Cal, as Calvin mentioned on uh, the Traders podcast that when he has over seventy percent CBAs, he averages one hundred and sixteen or thereabouts. So he's just as good as one any of those midfielders in the competition when he's going. So the one obviously concern with him is the new coach coming in from the Richmond system in Adam Kingsley. So does that hamper the Giants' game style? I think that it will in with some players, but I think guys like Stephen Keneally are just those accumulators. I think regardless of sort of what system they're in, I think they're just going to find the ball and sort of fill the stat sheet up to to put up these big scores. So um, in like some of his ceiling scores at the back end of last year, he scored 120, 121, 129 and 130. So maybe not that 135, 140 plus ceiling we have seen him go at in the past, but still that ceiling, which is a lot better than some of the other forwards. So... So, Mitch, what what are your thoughts on Cogs um, moving more into the midfield uh, with a new coach, but obviously potentially a new system being in place there? Yeah, look, I think I think he is definitely someone who's going to be you know in inside your top six forwards uh, come season's end, and I think he is definitely viewed as a guy that has upside from his starting price. The thing that I find myself leaning towards some other players is, well, firstly, he's the second most expensive forward um, of the group, even though he is a decent amount cheaper than uh, Dunkley, who's at number one. I still feel as though that 
he's probably not the he's not the first guy into that midfield. I'd say you'd have your Tom Greens. I personally would have a Josh Kelly in there ahead of him. Yeah. And he is on the older side of the list. He's 29 years old, the same age that sort of like a Tom Mitchell was last year for the Hawks. Um, so I think that it kind of, to me, there's a little bit of a risk that if the Giants get off to a, a poorer start or they, they trend a bit more towards, uh, I don't know, retooling or rebuilding or whatever it is you want to call it, um, that he might still present some volatility when it comes to his role. Um, I know you referenced the stats before that when he gets over sort of 70%, he was at 116 or and, and the back half of the year. To me, well, he only played four games last year where he's gone over 70% CBAs. So it's a bit of a small sample size for me to trust in a stat like that. And also there were a few, there was two games at the start of the year where he did have more than 50% CBAs. And if you include both of those uh, games as well, it does bring his average down to a 107 um, so for me, it's a lot of, it's kind of that, kind of that type of, you know, you use like after the buy stats or the last five rounds and, and, and sometimes it can, it can be a little bit misleading when we shorten sample sizes a little bit for players like that. Um, I like to look at, okay, what are they scoring in a row? And, uh, when you include those first couple of games in rounds one and two, I would consider that the same role that he had in the second half of the year. It's, again, closer to that 107. And if we're concerned about sort of the, the coach coming over, presenting more of a quote-unquote Richmond game or a front half game or a pressure game, whatever you want to call it, uh, perhaps you take a little bit of a shave off that score. Another year older, perhaps you're free, featuring a bit more of a Josh Kelly. Perhaps you're featuring a bit more of a Tom Green, who I think get first dibs in that midfield. I don't know if I see him being a 70% guy. I still see him around that sort of, you know, high 50s, 60% sort of a player. So for me, I sort of have him just a little bit behind a Taranto in scoring. Not much, but again, when you're starting more expensive and I think that you're a, just a hair behind the guy that's a bit cheaper than you, then for me, it's it's hard to sort of you know pick him over that guy that I think is better and cheaper. So those are just my thoughts. Um, he's, he's quite popular as well. So I think you reference a few decent enough ceiling games. You know, you had a couple of one, he had a one thirty, a few one twenties in there. Um, look, it's good, and obviously he's one of the best forwards. But I don't know if he's the kind of guy that you've got to go against him if he's really going to absolutely hurt you too badly. So um, when there are a lot of good forward options, he's kind of one that I'm okay. I think going against uh, with my starting squad. Yeah, yeah. As you mentioned, there's plenty of forwards uh, this year, which is, I think that at the end of last season, I thought we were going to lose a lot of them, but we have actually yeah. kept a couple of them, which is good. So there's plenty of guys vying for spots there. But I do like the fact that he is priced at 98. So as you mentioned, I think he can push over that 100 and go that. I do that think he's 100. 102 to 108. I see him somewhere in that mix, but it could yep. depend, as you mentioned, if he gets 60 or a bit more percent CBAs, I think he'll go closer to that 108. But if he gets maybe that high 50s to mid 50s, that might push a little bit lower to maybe below 105, maybe like 103, 104, somewhere around there. But I think he's still value. Um, and I do like both these players as well. So that will lead us on to who we're going to pick out of the two. So Mitch, I think for gathering from the argument, I can sort of sense what way you're going, but who would you be picking out of Cogs and Taranto for season 2020? Yes, yeah, so... So for me, Taranto has been a guy that's been in my side all preseason. He hasn't left. Between he and Dunkley, I think they're the two forwards, in my opinion, that are pretty much locked into my side. My F3 or the, the third, if it is a, a Cogs, it would be technically F2. But that that third or maybe fourth uh, forward, depending on how deep I want to go into that line, is is very much up for grabs for me. It's, um, it's funnily enough, very dependent on my rucks and my defenders. Um, you know, with news of Salem and, and all these hamstring issues for, for Cameron and, and Tim, Tim English, English, depending on depending on how much money I need to kind of fix up those other lines, that that third forward spot is often in flux to create that that cash for me to fix those positions up. So, um, you know, sometimes I'll need the cash for a player like Cornelio at 871K. If I, if I go down to a Rosie, that's $90,000 that I might be able to use to patch up another spot. If I go down even further to a Butters, there's over $100,000 there. So I often find myself using that spot to patch up another area on my field. So 
Um, not not going to rule out having both. I think I'm fairly confident unless I see something dramatically different to what I expect um, that I will have Taranto in my side. I think that it's probably less likely that I'm going to have a Cornelio as well, though. So for me, it's Taranto um, and and a slight chance of both. Yeah. Um, if you asked me this question a few weeks ago, I would have said Cole. I just I my main TBIs there, and I think he had those there, but. I, I'm leaning towards Taranto now after everything I'm hearing from Match Sims and like obviously winning all the time trials and everything like that. I just don't really see the Richmond game style being too much of an issue. May, he maybe not going to average 115 like he has in the past, but I think that 105, 110, I think is well within reach. So I think I'm going to go Taranto, even though I thought a couple of weeks ago I was going to go Cornelio, but I still like both. But the, as you mentioned, you've got Taranto on your side and Cogs um, might be coming, like, potentially in the mix. What percentage do you reckon that uh, you may start Cogs at 50 50 at the moment? Is it like maybe 30 70? What, Probably what maybe 25 75. 25% chance yeah. is there. It's, it's just more, I, I just don't know if I'm going to find the cash with a lot of other question marks and other players around my ground. Like, if we, if we suddenly have a, a player you know, in the defensive line, you know, say say Christian Salem does a 180 and and he, you know, is there for both um, preseason games and he's lighting up the fields and I can get him onto my field and that frees me up a bit more cash in that line then. You know, if I have the money, I still I still have him as my F3. You know, I've, I've got a, a Dunkley, a, a, um, a Taranto and then Cogs as, as my F3. So if he's the best that I can afford, then I'll, I'll, I'll get him in. But... It is sort of when I've got other options that I also don't mind, um, it's it's kind of the spot where I'm okay to take a haircut. So mm-hmm. it is very much dependent on what happens with the, the rest of my field. So, uh, But at this stage, it's looking less likely with um, still plenty of preseasons to go and plenty of chance for guys that I like to, you know, hit a few hiccups around the road. But uh, I'll, leave the, I'll leave the room there to be pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Uh, I've currently got both in my side as, as my F2 and F3. But as you mentioned, any... I'm sure that we're both going to be changing our teams hundreds of times oh, yeah. over the uh, the intra club games this weekend, the unofficial practice games next weekend, and the week after with the actual practice games because we still, still got four weekends to go before before we get stuck into the real uh, the real stuff. So, um, just quickly, last question before we let you go as well. We did have um, Louis on here doing the Zach Butters and Connor Rosie video. How would mm. you rank the four of them? How would you rank Taranto, Canelio, Butters, and Rosie in that four? Yeah, very tough one. I've got I've got Taranto one, um, Cogs. Uh, I've got Cogs three. Sorry, Taranto two, uh, one of this group. Uh, then I'll have Cogs. I'll actually sneak in a Dylan Moore there as well. I know we didn't include him, but I'll sneak him in there at number three. And then I've got Rosie by one point um, in yeah. my in my projections above uh, Butters, but again. That means that because of their starting price, that Butters to me is slightly more value. So again, if I need that extra 14000 or whatever it is, then it is a, a move that I, I would consider. I think Butters to me has like the highest ceiling um, just because he's got more of an upside to increase his CBAs from last year. But he does scare me a little bit. And uh, I feel like just because his ownership is low, it is a risky pick. Um, so... I'd prefer to have Rosie if I could, but again, it's 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 a battle that I think is really close, um, in my opinion. So um, those ones are all coin flips for me. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I'd have Taranto now. It was Cogs one, but now it's Taranto one, Cogs two, Rosie three, Butters four. That just that risk with Butters, just thinking like it's it's not that he is like a. Like maybe like a Tom Stewart or something that might be like a late withdrawal because of something or a Geelong player like with that. Butters always gets injured on a low score or he's affected for the rest of the game and can put up a low score. That's just the one thing that puts me off of him. But I wouldn't be surprised if this year he ends up going going better than, than Rosie. Maybe a couple of those forwards. So this is yeah, probably the yeah. year he's going to go off when no one's got him. When no one's got him, yeah. He, he, he does have the potential, honestly, to, to finish maybe at, at F2 behind a Dunkley. It would not it would not surprise me at yeah, all. He's exactly. that kind of a talent. Um, I think he's behind the pecking order in terms of a tag between uh, Wines, Rosie, and himself. So um, he just needs to put it all together, and, and he could do it. Um, it's definitely one that I'm not ruling myself off of. Uh, but, yeah, one 
big watch, I think, over in port between those two boys. But Because I, I think it is probably likely that I will have one of those guys in my team um, potentially in round one. It's just uh, a matter of who. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I'm the same. The both of them in the mix for me, but I'll probably only have one of them. So, I'll throw a question back to you. Are you yeah. are you going uh, three forwards deep currently, or or four in your in your forward line? Because um, I think this I might also allow people to get both to- Cogs and Taranto. I'm I'm currently batting with three. I was four earlier in the preseason, but again, with other lines giving me trouble, I've I've had to had to cut myself short. Yeah, uh, I'm currently uh, three deep at the moment. I've played around with Dunkley in my midfield and then having uh, Cogs, Taranto, and maybe like a Rosie or a Butters in my forward yep. line. That's something I've been playing with. But at the moment, it's three. I've, I'm using a little bit of ca- more cash probably than other people are in their defense at the moment. I'm going four deep, including Yo, if you're including one of, in those four, three. So, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see if that changes or whatever. But I have been actually a bit of a fan of, of putting a Dunkley type in the midfield because comparing a Rosie to an LDU, for example, or like a Tom Green, I might prefer a Rosie just because he's going to be a top six for. But that's good conversation to have anyway, um, which I'm yep. sure we can get into in another podcast. But thank you very much for joining me, Mitch. Um, it's been no worries, a pleasure man. having you on the podcast or the video today. Uh, where can everyone find you? Because you've been doing some very good work uh, with Luke over at the Ball Boys Fantasy. Yeah, so uh, at Ball Boys Fantasy on Twitter, at Ball Boys AFL Fantasy on YouTube, um, and any podcast platform, Spotify, um, you know, Apple Podcasts, wherever you sort of listen to your podcast, you can find us there. Um, we're on the goal of trying to get a thousand subscribers, as I'm sure you are as well. It's yeah. uh, it's the magic number for us YouTubers. So um, once you're done subscribing to, to Bales here, you can head over to our uh, YouTube channel and give us a, a subscribe as well. Uh, we, we're currently doing sort of two to three podcasts a week at the moment in the preseason, and we'll get settled into uh, a couple during the season as well. So we've just finished doing a, a bit of a, a similar kind of concept. I think I messaged you when you you tweeted out about this uh, player battles. We've done a similar yeah. kind of thing uh, with with each of the traders coming on to join us. Um, you know, similar sort of thing. Bit, bit less maybe in depth than going through three different battles in the one episode, but it's all a bit of fun and uh, similar kind of. We also had a, a Butters and, and Rosie debate as well and probably uh, left none the, <laughs> none the wiser after as well. But it's all a bit bit of fun with those boys. So uh, if, you, if you like this sort of content, go check out our, our channel as well. And uh, yeah. Let us know what you think. Yep, definitely go and check that. They, uh, You guys make great content over there. So go check them out, everyone. But uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you Let us know what your thoughts are on who you'd pick out of Canelio and Taranto. If you'd have one, both, none, who you'd prefer, let us know. And if there's any other questions, put them in the comment section below and I'll get to them as well. AFL Fantasy Fanatics Twitter spaces every Sunday night as well. So don't uh, miss them with me and Tim Guest. So... Thank you for joining me, Mitch, again, and we'll catch everyone on the next episode. We're out. Cheers. No worries.